Hello everyone. It is rainy outside tonight and a bit cold. So please join me in my study. It is all cozy here and we have a fire. And tonight we are going to explore the rich history of New Orleans. I'll tell you about the city itself, as well as some aspects of its culture, especially voodoo. What is it? And where does it come from? Let's begin our journey immediately with the story of one of New Orleans' most famous historical figures, and a mysterious one. The Queen of Voodoo, Marie Laveau. Our story begins in 1801, at a time when Louisiana and New Orleans were not yet part of the United States. New Orleans was a colonial city, a port of about 10,000 souls at the mouth of the Mississippi River and a thriving port because it connected the Mississippi Basin with Atlantic trade. Many vessels, large and small, visited it to bring food, luxury goods, slaves or building materials and take out New World products, furs, dyes, sugar or cotton that they brought back to Europe. From the docks that were constantly teeming with life, with their sailors, their taverns and their busy stores, to elegant neighborhoods where recently built mansions showed off the wealth of their owners or even to the modest houses where a crowd of free laborers and slaves lived, the city was very diverse and harbored a society that did not really have an equivalent in the Americas. Along the 18th century, the city had been French, then Spanish, then French again, But not for long, because in 1803, when Marie was two, Louisiana was sold to the United States. And the society of New Orleans in the early 19th century, where she grew up, was a mix of European, African and Native American populations. The high society of New Orleans was made of wealthy planters who had moved from French colonies like Haiti. There were also colonial administrators, often from the small French or Spanish nobility, and traders or bankers who had been attracted to this dynamic trade hub. There was a middle class of shop owners, lawyers, contractors or teachers, and thousands and thousands of workers, on the docks or house employees, like cooks, maids or housekeepers, many of them slaves. Out of a census in 1805, About two-fifths of the population was white, two-fifths was black slaves, and one-fifth free black citizens, individuals who had been emancipated, they had been granted or they had been able to buy back their liberty, and their descendants who were born free. Many had arrived along wealthy families of planters coming from Haiti, or they were the descendants of slaves born in New Orleans. We will come back to this, but 
a decade before the birth of Marie Laveau. Many French planters had fled Haiti and settled in New Orleans after the Haitian Revolution. The presence of so many free black and mixed race people in colonial cities was not unseen, but it was particularly important in New Orleans, and even more when the city became part of the United States. In the southern states, where slavery was widespread, New Orleans could appear as almost a safe haven for black people, a place where, in the first decades of the 19th century, black people who had been freed could go and live in communities of equals. In 1801, New Orleans had already gained many different cultural influences – French, Spanish, Creole, African from different regions of Africa. Different languages were spoken. It was mainly a city of immigrants. Even the appearance of the city reflected this variety of influences. The layout had been designed by French engineers, but the architecture was mostly colonial Spanish. As it still is in the French Quarter, the historical center, religious beliefs included Roman Catholicism, the usual religion of the high classes, and also Voodoo a religion that mixed influences from Christianity and African religions. It could take different forms, and we will also come back to it later. But such was the original and exciting universe where Marie Laveau was born. A city with opportunities, rather wealthy and growing, but also a harsh world where social classes and races were segregated, where justice was not always a reality, and also a rather violent and dangerous world in which you were at risk every day of being attacked, robbed, or worse. Marie was born somewhere in the middle of this social pyramid. Her parents were a white Frenchman, a politician, Charles Laveau, and her mother a free woman of color, with white, black, and Native American ancestry. This made her, by birth, a free woman of color. These categories of race and rights were strongly enforced across various colonial societies all around the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico. Mixed-race individuals were designated depending on their ancestry and their share of white and African blood. There were quadroons, meaning one quarter African and three quarters European, octoroons, which was one-eighth black, and even quintroons, one-sixteenth black. Of course, these categories reflected a social hierarchy, and depending on the colonies, they could have legal implications sometimes. But in the case of New Orleans, there was also a degree of mixing, among the middle and working classes, as exemplified by Mary's parents. We know very little about her childhood, but it appears in records of her parish that in 1819, aged 18, she married a carpenter, a quadroon, so one-fourth black, called Jacques Paris also a free man of color, who had fled the Haitian Revolution and moved to Louisiana. 
They had two daughters together, including one two years before the wedding and one after. This kind of thing, having children out of wedlock, would have been frowned upon more than 200 years ago. But in colonial societies or during the first decades of the United States as an independent country, it was also very common. It happened. In practice, norms were a bit more relaxed than they would become in the late 19th century or early 20th century. And we see it also in her following years. Her husband died early in 1820, just one year after the wedding. And soon after, she entered a domestic partnership with another man. And they lived together until his death in 1855, like husband and wife, except they were not married. And together they had at least seven children. This didn't stop her ascension inside her community and in New Orleans society, as we are going to see. So it shows that this was more or less tolerated, at least for a woman like her. Her new companion was a normal man of French descent. And from this we can guess two things. The first one is that she must have had a particular charm. She lived with someone who enjoyed a good social position and was probably relatively wealthy, whereas she was not rich by birth. Her first husband was a carpenter. And this new wealth and status probably helped her own career, because over the years she acquired a quite strong financial situation. During her lifetime, she herself owned at least seven different slaves, indicating some economic power, and she developed a business of her own. She opened a beauty parlor, where she worked as a hairdresser for the wealthy families of New Orleans. She never became part of New Orleans high society. She could only be an outsider to it, due to her social origins that were too modest, and because she was a woman of color. And also she lived with a man and had plenty of children with him without being married. Each of these reasons, individually, were enough to keep her out of the high society. But it didn't mean she had no contacts. Visiting her hair salon, talking to her, gossiping in her presence, or turning to her for advice, were things that rich women would do. And it seems they did it because her personality, her charisma, and above all her practice of voodoo that she developed over the years made her an attractive person to be in touch with. We will return to what voodoo is later. But at an undefined time, Marie Laveau also emerged as a dedicated practitioner of this religion, as well as a healer and an herbalist. She could provide you with remedies, advice, possibly potions, and also grigri, voodoo charms, that were believed to protect or help wishes come true. Her knowledge of voodoo, her contacts all across the society in New Orleans, from the most humble neighborhoods to the inside of the fanciest mansions, her ambition, probably. This turned her into an original figure who could be at ease everywhere, gathered a lot of information, and who was at the same time respected and a bit feared. Someone with no official position, but that you wanted on your side. If not for the powers she would have had, 
at least for her influence. So people of all classes turn to her for all sorts of advice, for charms, called her to help birth. She also acted as a midwife to perform rituals on their behalf or just to make sure they were on good terms with her. This influence and reputation gave her the unofficial title of Queen of Voodoo in New Orleans. Voodoo was an informal cult. There was no clergy or officials. But as it happens, female leaders emerged in New Orleans and became figures of authority. There had been two other women before her, one called Samité Dédé, and then a second one, Marie Salopé. Marie Laveau became the third queen, and her informal but long rule, several decades during the 19th century, took place at a time when New Orleans was booming. When Marie was born, there would have been around 10,000 inhabitants. When she became adult and a widow in 1820, the figure had already tripled. By 1850, when she was already well established as the Queen of Voodoo, there were more than a hundred thousand inhabitants. And when she died, two hundred thousand. From a somewhat prosperous colonial port, New Orleans had turned into the gateway to the American South. By 1860, it was the third largest port in the United States after Boston and New York, and the largest in the South, and also the second wealthiest city in America in terms of income per capita. This inflow of new inhabitants changed the culture, but it also multiplied practitioners or knowers of voodooism, demultiplying Marie's influence. It seems she embraced this change and kept her authority and popularity all the way to her death in 1881. Her fame grew all the time, not just as a practitioner of voodoo, as a healer or businesswoman, but also as a community leader. She was known to care for the sick, she visited prisoners, she performed rituals free of charge for those who could not afford her services. It is hard to know what she thought of this. Was it public relations to uh, affirm her popularity, politics, or was it genuine care for others, or both at the same time? We don't exactly know, because she left no writing and she did no public speeches to explain her goals. She was all about implicit influence, of the kind that doesn't need to be verbalized. But one thing is sure, any resident of New Orleans by the mid-19th century, rich or poor, powerful or not, had heard of her and knew who she was. There were, and there still are, plenty of stories, of rumors, that credit her for her powers as a clairvoyant and her magical abilities. As I said before, it may help to be as well connected as she was and run a beauty parlor where she could listen to the gossips of the good society. This information might have helped her to sound clairvoyant. She certainly handled a lot of information, but the point is that people believed she had these powers and could do something for them. At least her ability to remain popular and influent for decades in a city that was fastly changing, this tells a lot about her charisma and uh, 
aura of authority. There are testimonies telling how she moved around the streets of New Orleans, acting as if she owned the city. She was surrounded by rumors, for example, that she owned a white snake named Zombie, after an African god, that as a voodoo priestess, she called on African spirits and Catholic saints to intervene, that her charms and voodoo rituals could change destinies. None of this can be substantiated, but of course, true or false, she never did anything to dissipate the ambiguity that served her so well. And she was also probably a good politician, because she kept good relations with everyone, including the Catholic Church. Apart from voodoo, Roman Catholicism was the other religion that competed for the devotion of people in Louisiana. But the two were not necessarily antagonists. Voodoo incorporates a lot of Catholic elements, and being a voodoo practitioner did not imply a rejection of Catholicism. People still went to churches to be baptized, to get married, or more often to just attend Catholic masses. Marie Laveau also appeared as a good Catholic woman, she collaborated with the church for charities, so she was not rejected by the local church. This would have been unthinkable in Europe, for example, nearer from the Vatican. By the mid-19th century, the Roman Catholic Church was quite aggressively fighting against dissent and political changes that threatened the old order like the abolition of monarchies and the rise of liberal principles of democracy, individualism, or the questioning of traditions. So there would have been a crackdown on this kind of compromission with beliefs seen as heretic. But in the new world, with the distance, in a country that was more protestant than catholic, the Catholic Church had to be pragmatic, and so in New Orleans it tolerated voodoo and did not reject its practitioners, even though there was a fundamental disagreement with it. So much so that when Marie died in 1881, news of her death was featured in several newspapers across the United States because she was a well-known local figure. Articles in which she was depicted as a benevolent, pious figure who had done a lot for the poor. She had a Catholic funeral and was buried in a Catholic cemetery at the traditional St. Louis Cemetery where all families of New Orleans, including hers, owned crypts. She had been such an influential figure that her death was a big blow to Louisiana voodoo. There was no one to replace her as the obvious voodoo queen, and voodooism in Louisiana began to decline. She had been like a bridge between two ages, between a colonial past of the 18th century, in which New Orleans was much smaller, pre-industrial, where small communities of slaves of the first or second generations tried to survive, not just materially, but also spiritually and culturally, by preserving some of their ancestors' beliefs. This old age slowly disappeared during her life, giving way to a new age, especially after the American Civil War, one of technical progress in which slavery had been abolished. 
steamboats, railroads and factories had popped up. Most of society was no longer organized around plantations, and New Orleans was much larger, and people had turned more skeptical. Maybe there was no place for voodoo as it had been in this new world, or not as much as before. Or maybe she was one exceptional figure that could not be replaced. But in any case, Louisiana voodoo quickly became more marginal. It never disappeared and still has followers, but it went underground and uh, no longer had the same importance and visibility that it had under Marie Laveau. So, after this quick portrait of Marie Laveau, there is an important question. What is voodoo, actually? We are going to explore this, but first, take a moment to let go of the tension in your shoulders, your arms, your legs, all the way down to your feet and toes. Breathe normally and feel free to shut your eyes at any time. If you fall asleep, you can always come back later. If you like it better, you can also listen to my stories on Spotify. Apple Music or other audio streaming services. You will find the link in the first comment or you can easily find me there. And I also invite you to join my Patreon if you wish to. It gives you the possibility to download everything I do, including the same stories with background sound effects. You also contribute to keep this channel ad-free for everyone. And you can participate in surveys, listen to the stories as podcasts, or get regular updates about what comes next. But for now, let's return to tonight's story. What is voodoo? The way this term, voodoo, is perceived today comes with two problems. The first one is that the same name, Voodoo, is given to very different religions or sets of beliefs and practices in Africa and in America. In America, they developed inside the African diaspora, from Brazil or Colombia to the Caribbean and the south of the United States. These religions are loosely connected because they have these African roots mixed with Christian and native influences, which is why they are called syncretic religions. They incorporate different influences, but they are also different from one another because of the distances, the different local conditions, and also because African slaves who were deported to the other side of the Atlantic came from very different regions with their own cultures. The people from Senegal lived thousands of miles away from Nigeria or Angola. They had different languages, different traditions, mythologies and beliefs. So, the term voodoo is like an umbrella term. There are different types of voodoo. Candomblé, a Brazilian religion, is one of them. And so are Cuban, Dominican, Haitian or Louisiana voodoo. And there are more. A second thing is that voodoo, especially the Haitian and the Louisiana versions of it, has become known by the public mainly through popular culture, where it is generally shown, depicted, as a kind of black magic with spells, curses, 
the sessions, Grigri, these charms, or zombies. Zombies have become so well known as undead reanimated corpses that we forget that the terms come from Haitian folklore, in which a zombie is a dead body reanimated through magic, including voodoo. So, voodoo has been exploited in novels or movies in a way that makes it a bit sinister. A vision that is sensationalist and exotic. But this image is very far from the historical reality of it, or the intentions of practitioners as they appear in historical records or their testimonies in the present. So let's go back in time and take a look at the origins of voodoo. The word voodoo and a big influence on American voodoo can be traced to an African religion called Vodun, V-O-D-U-N that historically dominated in the kingdom of Dahomey in West Africa, regions that are in modern Benin, Togo, Ghana and Nigeria. Vodun cosmology centers on spirits that govern everything in our world. Some are very powerful major deities governing the forces of nature but everything, from individual trees, lakes or rocks, or natural phenomena, has its own spirit that can be worshipped or appealed to. In that sense, it is what anthropologists call an animistic religion, one that reflects the belief that objects, places and creatures or even concepts, all possess a distinct spiritual essence. This kind of conception has been observed all around the world, on every continent through history. You also find it in Native American or Asian belief systems, for example in Japanese Shinto, but there are many more. Traditionally, Priestesses, women called Queen Mother, play a central role in this religion. A characteristic that crossed the Atlantic, and that the case of Marie Laveau illustrates, the Queen Mother is the first daughter of the previous Queen, and she holds the right to lead ceremonies in Voden. Their role is not just spiritual or ceremonial. They are also one of the most important members of their community. They lead other women. They organize and run markets, which is very important because marketplaces are where gatherings and socialization take place, primarily. When West African Vodun was first put in contact with Catholicism through traders and soon missionaries, it appeared to many as compatible because the Roman Catholic doctrines included the intercession of saints or angels, a multiplicity of figures that gave access to the divine world. Of course, any Catholic theologian would argue that saints and angels are not spirits attached to material things and that worshipping them is not appropriate. But for common people, there appeared to be a, a compatibility, a plasticity between their traditional religion and uh, the message, the uh, iconography, and the traditions of Catholicism. So instead of fully converting, they found a space for both. This influenced religious practices in Africa. 
not just in the case of Vodun. Other religions like the Yoruba religion and its multiple Orishas. I told you about them in a past story about African mythologies. They could also find ways of accommodating a Catholic influence, of combining different beliefs. But even more than in Africa, the combination of Vodun and other African religions with Catholicism found fertile ground in America, in enslaved communities. In every country or place where a large number of African slaves lived and were exposed to Catholicism with the intention to convert them, this syncretism happened. Brazil, Colombia or Venezuela in South America, a lot of Caribbean islands and later the American southern states, often coming from the Caribbean. Louisiana voodoo was strongly influenced by Haitian voodoo. So this is what loosely connects all these beliefs called voodoo. But each one developed independently, and they started to be called voodoo collectively in the 19th century even though they had begun to develop at least 200 years before. To the people who followed these practices and beliefs, they were just their faith and their way of making sense of the world, of finding a spiritual life and uh, turning to uh, divine figures that could uh, help them, comfort them in this life and after. So, the largest of these syncretic religions that appeared in America include several ones in Brazil, the most famous one being Candomblé, Santeria in Cuba, and Haitian Voodoo in Haiti. These were places with a large number of African slaves, and as we said earlier, Louisiana voodoo was strongly influenced by Haiti. So let's talk about the rise of Haitian voodoo. Haiti is the western part of the island of Hispaniola, which was first colonized by the Spanish and after shared between France and Spain. The Spanish part became the Dominican Republic. Afro-Haitian communities appeared in the 16th century. But the colony that would become Haiti had an extraordinary development in the 17th and 18th centuries. It became like the jewel of French colonies in America, because it was a place where, more than in many other colonies, a large and prosperous plantation economy emerged. The colony produced and exported various crops, sugar, cotton, coffee, dyes, and large fortunes were made there. Behind this success, there was a human reality, which was a system based on slavery, a place where the bulk of the population was slaves of African descent and a minority of planters, some large and very wealthy, others smaller, but a society of control, of punishment, of abuse, that could exist for such a long time only because it was financially profitable and closed enough, far enough, for the rest of the world to tolerate it or pretend not to see. There were actually several voices that arose in the 18th century to condemn what was happening in American colonies and what the cost of these exotic colonial goods really was. But apart from minimal regulations that were rarely enforced, not much was done to change it. It was just too profitable and a large part of the European public did not really care for the fate of slaves. 
until a revolution took place in Haiti, starting in 1791, when France was in its own revolution and unable to intervene in the West Indies. This Haitian revolution eventually led to the independence of the country after decades of conflicts. But even before the independence, a specifically Haitian culture had appeared. At its center was Haitian voodoo. The Africans in Haiti mainly came from West and Central Africa, including from the Yoruba and Fon peoples. The Fons followed the Vodun religion, and Haitian voodoo was the product, the combination of Yoruba and Vodun faiths from Africa, with the Roman Catholic and also, to a lesser extent, the Freemason influence of French colonialists. The voodoo religion in Haiti is not organized with a a formal hierarchy, but it comes with a complex belief system, a morality and ethics, elaborate rituals, a specific iconography, worship places. Its practitioners see it as a force for good, which is why it is probably unfair to see it reduced in the media to a kind of sorcery using tropes like the control of dark spirits or voodoo dolls to control or inflict pain on people remotely. Just to stop for a second on voodoo dolls, these effigies into which pins would be inserted. These dolls are found in the magical traditions of many cultures around the world. They are present in African Vodun as charms or supports to get protection, but they are not particularly prominent in Haitian voodoo, and they are not even used at all in Louisiana voodoo. So their name, voodoo dolls, is not particularly deserved or justified. Haitian voodoo had a strong influence on Louisiana because when the revolution started in Haiti, many planters fled the colony, taking some of their slaves with them, the ones they could, or the ones that preferred to stay with their masters. And there was also a number of free black people from Haiti who preferred to move to Louisiana in the decade of 1790 and 1800. Voodoo in New Orleans is not just a branch of Haitian voodoo, because there was already a large community of slaves in Louisiana, coming mainly from other regions of Africa. Bambara from the west, what is now Guinea, Burkina Faso and Mali, and Congo from Central Africa. There was also, of course, the local Roman Catholic presence, and Louisiana voodoo emerged between the 18th and 19th centuries as a syncretism of these different influences. It is hard to quickly define the content of Louisiana voodoo, its beliefs, deities, and rites, because it has evolved and also there was never official texts or doctrines that presented it. There is also no undisputed figure of authority. It is completely decentralized, and it was also always rather secretive. It was always practiced outside the public eye. So we know Louisiana voodoo in the 19th century, at the time of Marie Laveau, mainly through a few testimonies or press articles. These historical records reveal the names of various deities or figures of worship, like Blanc Dany, the Grand Zombie, or Papa Leba. 
The names are in French Creole. Blanc Danny, also known as Monsieur Danny, was often depicted as a serpent, and this deity was associated with discord and the defeat of enemies. It is unclear whether it was entirely separate from the grand zombie. The word zombie is derived from a Bantu word, Nzambi, which means god or spirit. The grand zombie could be translated as great god or great spirit. Papa Leba was a doorkeeper as well as a trickster and this deity was probably derived from the Yoruba religion. There were more, less common figures, like Monsieur Assonker, associated with good fortune, or Monsieur Agusu, the protector of love. To obtain the favors of these deities, you would pray to them and offer small gifts and animal sacrifices. Now I speak of them in the past, because even though Louisiana voodoo still exists, it is unclear whether these names still have worshippers. In the late 19th and early 20th century, the practice of Louisiana voodoo collapsed. It did not entirely disappear, but it became so marginal that there are barely any traces of it in records. We can assume small groups kept the traditions alive, but it is unknown how many, or if they were in contact between them. And a revival happened in the second half of the 20th century but with characteristics that were borrowed from Haitian voodoo or Cuban santeria. For example, the divinities, which are called Iwa in Haiti, began to be adopted in Louisiana voodoo. Some of them, such as Legba, could be apparented to old Louisiana voodoo gods, but there was apparently a break and contemporary Louisiana voodoo is markedly different from what it was 200 or 150 years ago. What hasn't changed is the worship of Catholic saints as independent intercessors to the gods or the spirits of ancestors, or possibly associated with voodoo gods, Saint Peter, or Saint Anthony of Padua would have been particularly popular in the 19th century. Another thing that is debated is whether voodoo is fully polytheistic as a religion. Conceptions differ, and they show that this distinction between polytheistic and monotheistic religions, that is to say, religions with several gods or only one unique god, is not always pertinent. In the Yoruba religion that influenced Louisiana voodoo, there is a multiplicity of orishas, of gods, or divine creatures, but there is also the conception that these are all different faces, different aspects of a single divine being, who encompasses everything. There could have been the same belief in voodoo. And actually, among modern practitioners of Louisiana voodoo, there is a discourse saying that all these different entities are a way of approaching, of coming into contact with a divine entity that would otherwise be too distant and impossible to comprehend. Another trait of Louisiana voodoo is the devotion to uh, the spirits of the dead, of the ancestors. And here again, the African influence is visible. A large part of the black population in New Orleans descended from enslaved Congolese, 
and the traditional religions in Congo placed emphasis on honoring the spirits of the ancestors. But now let's take a look at the history of New Orleans in general, which was particularly agitated in the 18th and 19th centuries, and this shaped its identity. The city was founded in the spring of 1718 as the main port of the colony of Louisiana by the French Mississippi Company. For 30 years, the French had had the project of founding a colony at the mouth of the Mississippi. And like other European countries at the time, this was done through a corporation. These companies received royal approval and exclusive trading rights on a region of the world for a given period of time. And it was their responsibility to gather funds, invest in international trade and the production of colonial goods, and generate profits for their shareholders. It is another story, but the Mississippi Company became the company of the Indies one year after the creation of New Orleans, and it became the object of intense speculation on the stock market, and then a spectacular financial collapse. This was one of the earliest examples of a stock market bubble and burst. But it didn't stop New Orleans from growing, slowly and painfully at the start, because the colony of Louisiana in general faced struggles with numerous Native American tribes. The city had been installed on land inhabited by the Chitimacha. North of it lived the Natchez, and of course they had not been asked if they agreed to see these foreigners take their ancestral lands. Several conflicts erupted in the 1720s and 1730s, leading to full-blown colonial wars. Another threat was the expansionism of the British 13 colonies to the east. Until the Seven Years' War, there was no open conflict, but each side formed alliances with native tribes. And the tribes played on this rivalry to launch raids east or west of the Appalachian Mountains. Several times, New Orleans was the place where residents of Louisiana had to take refuge. But despite these conflicts, the port still grew to a few thousand people and became well inserted into the Atlantic trade. It was a place to sell furs that trappers collected around the Mississippi to export the production of Louisiana plantations and bring in European products. And more than anything, bring the slave workforce that was needed to make the plantation economy work. Of this first French period, that lasted for 45 years, New Orleans kept part of its layout, including the French Quarter and various institutions, like a convent of the uh, Ursuline Sisters that founded an academy, and many schools in New Orleans can trace their lineage from this uh, Ursuline Academy. But this period ended after the Seven Years' War. France had lost, and it cost it Canada and Louisiana. Canada became British, but not Louisiana. It was ceded to Spain as compensation. And so began 40 years of a Spanish period. A period when a few Spanish colonists arrived, but many more Cajuns relocating from other lost French colonies of North America. The blend of cultures continued to form. French, Spanish, Native American and African 
because the black population grew all along the 18th century, with the arrival of slave ships and their descendants. With the passing of generations and the emancipation of former slaves, society became more complex and appeared a significant community of free black people. Most old buildings from the 18th century in New Orleans are from this Spanish period, which is why if you look at the appearance of the French Quarter, you will see similarities with other Spanish colonial cities like Havana in Cuba. Finally, at the end of the century, the French Revolution had big repercussions on New Orleans, indirectly and even though it was Spanish at the time. First, because it made the Haitian Revolution easier, and with it arrived another group of French planters and traders escaping Haiti. And then, because after the fall of several revolutionary governments in France, arose Napoleon, and he imposed to Spain the return of Louisiana and the French control, just to sell it to the United States two years later. In the 1800s, the now American city grew very fast, faster than ever. Due to the arrival of ever more French Creoles and African slaves, later in the century they were followed by Irish, Italian, German and Poles. Relative to other cities in the United States, New Orleans reached its peak by the middle of the 19th century. At the time, its position at the mouth of the Mississippi, when plantation economy was booming in the south of the United States, migrants kept arriving and advanced to the west or stayed. Its attractiveness for black people in the south, if they could become free, because there was a large and already old community of free people of color in New Orleans, all of this brought fast growth and prosperity to the city. By 1840, New Orleans was said to be one of the wealthiest large cities in America. This is hard to verify, but it was in any case the third most populous after New York City and Baltimore, and the third largest port after New York and Boston. This world changed dramatically during and after the American Civil War. The city was occupied by the Union Navy, and the Civil War confirmed a shift in the city's culture that the French-speaking Creole elite had been fearing for a long time. With the arrival of immigrants from Europe, the French language had been declining from the majority of the population until 1830 to a fourth of it at the turn of the century. English was increasingly becoming dominant in business and politics, and this was reinforced by the abolition of French language instruction in city schools during the Reconstruction period, or the progressive disappearance of newspapers in French. Even though it kept its old architecture, some of its traditions, and its history, the second half of the 19th century and the first half of the 20th century is when New Orleans became much more similar to other American cities. And it was also a time of relative decline, economically and demographically. The city kept gaining inhabitants, but other cities grew much faster across America, and New Orleans never became the kind of industrial center that permitted explosive growth in that period, like for example in Chicago or New York City. The growth of railways and later highways 
made the location of New Orleans and the Mississippi less relevant. Even in the South, it was progressively overtaken by Houston, Dallas or Atlanta. Despite the abolition of slavery, Louisiana and New Orleans went through the same racial tensions and segregation laws that marked U.S. history in the late 19th and 20th centuries. It became an important center of the civil rights movement in the 1960s, with its still very large black community. Another aspect of New Orleans culture that appealed in the black communities is its contribution to music, and especially jazz music. The music in New Orleans had a profound effect on the creation of early jazz. Why and why in New Orleans? A tradition appeared before the Civil War of gatherings where people would play drums and try different instruments, including European instruments, mixed with percussions. For a long time, New Orleans was the only city in North America where slaves were allowed to gather in public and play music together. They did it in particular in a place called the Congo Square. Types and genres of music that also appeared in the south of the United States, like blues and ragtime, were well represented and influential in New Orleans. Not in places of academic culture, but in the streets, in ordinary people's everyday life. There were black marching bands and dance bands in the late 19th century that used characteristic rhythms and melodies of African and Creole origin played on European instruments, including brass and string instruments like the cello or drums. So there was a local scene for this music and uh, some bands began touring in the south, outside of Louisiana. The existence of an audience, the possibility to live from music, the emulation between multiple bands, and the influences of blues and ragtime, all of this gave birth to a distinct musical style that would soon be known as jazz sometime between the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. A music characterized by swing and blue notes. Swung notes refer to a technique that involves alternately lengthening and shortening the first and second consecutive notes in a beat. This is what gives jazz its particular rhythm that is immediately recognizable. Blue notes that are characteristic of jazz and blues are notes that are played or sung at a slightly different pitch from standard. You know that the distance between notes, one tone, is standard, and we are used to this distance. Playing notes in between, a semitone, is something very common in classical music. But a blue note is floating somewhere between a quarter tone and a semitone, which makes it titillating, subtle. And jazz or blues use these blue notes all the time, which give them freedom and expressiveness. There are other characteristics of jazz including its complex chord, but they vary a lot because this genre exploded in the 1920s and it spread around the world, where it drew on local musical cultures. However, New Orleans is the cradle of jazz, because this is where the invention of this form of musical expression took place and many of the most brilliant jazz players and singers 
are from New Orleans, including, for example, Louis Armstrong. Today, the metropolitan area of New Orleans has 1.2 million inhabitants. It is still a relevant city. It faces challenges, economic and social, or natural, including its exposure to hurricanes and floods, and sometimes they can be tragic, as with Katrina in 2005, when the system of flood walls that was supposed to protect the city failed. But nothing could take away the charm and the original identity that New Orleans has acquired over more than 300 years of existence. We have now reached the end of our little tour for tonight. You can now let go and fall asleep. And I'll be back soon with another story. Sleep well. Sweet dreams. Au revoir.